Hello everyone. Today we're going to be taking a look at 15 questions for evolutionists from Creation Ministries International. I had thought this would be a relatively straightforward and honest question and answer sort of thing. Then I saw this. Dishonesty. Step 1! Evolution is not the naturalistic origin of life and its diversity. Evolution merely explains the diversity of life we see today, not its origin. That's abiogenesis. So there we have it. Step one, dishonesty. Well, I see how this is going to go. Let's move on to the questions. Well, I, I guess we see why they made the title so deceptive. It was so they could wedge this first question in. How did life originate? I believe I mentioned before that the theory of evolution does not address the origin of life, only the mechanisms of the diversity of life we see today. But that being said, let's look at the question anyway. First, Paul Davies statement Nobody knows how a mixture of lifeless chemicals spontaneously organize themselves into the first living cell is irrelevant, because nobody says a mixture of lifeless chemicals spontaneously organize themselves into the first living cell. The first precursors to life were simple self-replicating molecules that came into existence simply by chemicals following the basic laws of chemistry. And don't start this where there are laws, there is a lawgiver crap. As for Andrew Knoll's statement, it's essentially accurate. However, we don't really know does not equal God did it. As for the rest of the paragraph, it can be safely ignored, because no one says, chemicals, poof, cell. And somebody want to fill me in on what he means by molecular vibration? All right. On to question number two. How did the DNA code originate? Well, we can already see where this is going. This is essentially word salad. DNA is not a code. It is not a language system. It does not have letters and words. The meaning of words is irrelevant because there are no words in it. DNA is basically our hereditary material. It's made up of molecules called nucleotides. Each nucleotide contains a phosphate group, a sugar group, and a nitrogen base. The four types of nitrogen bases are adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. It is a long and very complex molecule, but complexity does not mean God did it. And it's no more a created code than iron is a created code for iron oxide. What do you think? Having fun so far? Hey, there's only 13 more to go. Question number three. How could mutations, accidental copying mistakes, DNA letters exchanged, deleted, or added, genes duplicated, chromosome inversions, etc., create the huge volume of information in the DNA of living things? This entire question is basically an argument from incredulity. My, that's awfully complex. How could that have happened? As for mutations being known for their destructive effects, yes. Some mutations will result in the death of the organism. The ones that do not result in the death of the organism result in a change. That change can either impart an advantage or a disadvantage on the organism. Further, this whole information issue is sort of a fuzzy one. Is information merely the number of base pairs in DNA? Or is information the resultant features of the organism in question. In either case, as I said, this entire question is purely an argument from incredulity. Question number four. Why is natural selection, a principle recognized by creationists, taught as evolution, as if it explains the origin of the diversity of life? This question is a classic straw man argument. Natural selection is not taught as evolution. 
natural selection is one of the mechanisms of evolution. That is all that needs to be said about question number four. It was intentionally deceptive. Ooh, there's a shock. And we don't like it. Question number five. How did new biochemical pathways which involve multiple enzymes working together in sequence originate? This is actually a pretty good question. Unfortunately, the only reason they're asking it is because they think it's too complex for most people to answer. So let's look into it a bit, shall we? Complex biochemical pathways would not have started out that way. They would have started off as a few molecules interacting in a simple manner. Mutation can cause duplication where the same gene is coded twice by accident. If this happens to a gene that codes for the molecules in a pathway, and if a mutation now affects only one of the genes, the other gene can act as a backup, making sure the biochemical pathway doesn't break down and the organism can pass on the new duplicated gene. While one of the genes carries out the pathway, the other gene is free to become mutated. That's how. Question number six. Living things look like they were designed, so how do evolutionists know that they were not designed? This rock formation looks like it was designed, so how do you know that it was not designed? It clearly has a large portal for ships to pass through and shelter themselves from storms. See what I did there? It doesn't matter what looks like happened, it only matters what did happen. Question number seven. How did multicellular life originate? Again, this is a great question. The failure to answer it, however, does not necessarily mean God did it. At present, there are several theories as to how multicellular organisms came to be. The symbiotic theory, for example, suggests that the first multicellular organisms occurred from cooperation between different species of single-celled organisms, each with different roles. Over time, they would become so dependent on each other, they wouldn't be able to survive independently. Eventually, this would lead to the incorporation of their genomes into one multicellular organism. The colonial theory proposes symbiosis of many cells of the same species. It's even been seen that genes borrowed from viruses have been identified as playing a crucial role in the differentiation of multicellular tissues. It is a very complicated topic, and none of these answers would be accepted by a creationist anyway. If you can't produce an answer that sounds like, the answer is four, they'll respond with, you don't know, therefore God. Alright, let's move on to the next question. Question number eight. How did sex originate? I assume they mean sex with others. Number eight goes on to ask the question, asexual reproduction gives up to twice as much reproductive success for the same resources as sexual reproduction, so how could the latter ever gain enough advantage to be selected? Well, some of the main advantages are, uh, with sexual reproduction, there are more variations produced. Helps ensure the survival of the species uh, in a population. Um, also, uh, the newly formed individuals have characteristics from both parents. Variations are also more likely to be viable in sexual mode than in asexual mode. Now, as for the invention of the complementary apparatuses, Quite obviously, any organism with an apparatus that was not capable of completing the union would be weeded out in a single generation. Question number nine. Why are the expected countless millions of transitional fossils missing? This, my friends, is what we call a dumbass question. Fossilization is not the rule, but the exception. Most things that die decompose completely, never to be seen again. This is not, however, the only problem we have with dealing with creationists on this particular issue. If you produce two fossils, and one appears to be a descendant of the other, they will then demand a third fossil to be the intermediate between those two. If you are lucky enough to find such a fossil, 
then they will demand two additional ones to go in between each one of those. It's a never-ending process, unless you have a fossil of every parent and every child throughout history, the argument will never end. Question number 10. How do living fossils remain unchanged over supposed hundreds of millions of years if evolution has changed worms into humans in the same time frame? Oh, I don't know. Perhaps they were best suited to their environment exactly as they were, and any variations were weeded out by natural selection. Next question. Question number 11. How did blind chemistry create mind intelligence, meaning, altruism, and morality? Okay, as far as I know, blind chemistry was not involved in the process. Honestly, it sounds a little dangerous. Further, any variation that moved a population closer to these traits would confer an evolutionary advantage. Would anyone deny that a population wherein each member had some level of concern for other members of its group would be more likely to survive? So there you have it. The simple answer is variation and natural selection. Not much more to say about it. Question number 12. Why is evolutionary just-so storytelling tolerated? The question goes on to quote Dr. Philip Skell, sadly deceased, who wrote, Darwinian explanations for such things are often too supple. Natural selection makes humans self-centered and aggressive, except when it makes them altruistic and peaceable. Or natural selection produces virile men who eagerly spread their seed, except when it prefers men who are faithful protectors and providers. When an explanation is so supple that it can explain any behavior, it is difficult to test it experimentally, much less use it as a catalyst for scientific discovery. Oh, I'm sorry, did, did I say they quoted Dr. Philip Skell? That, my mistake, I'm sorry, my apologies. I meant they quote mind, Dr. Philip Skell. If they had looked in the very next paragraph, they would have seen the line, none of this demonstrates that Darwinism is false. Dr. Skell was not arguing against evolution. He was merely stating where it should not be used in his opinion. So you see the level of dishonesty we're dealing with here. Question number 13. Where are the scientific breakthroughs due to evolution? Hmm. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? This is, once again, an excellent example of quote mining. In this particular quote, Dr. Kirshner was actually complaining that evolution was not taken into account and proposing some of the reasons why it may not have been taken into account. It was, in fact, Dr. Kirshner's position that progress would have been made much more quickly had evolutionary theory been taken into account. But I guess we couldn't expect the creationists to mention that little fact, could we? Question number 14. Science involves experimenting to figure out how things work, how they operate. Why is evolution, a theory about history, taught as if it's the same as this operational science? This question is based on a false dichotomy, that there are two separate forms of science, operational and historical. This is not the case. There is only science. What this question refers to as history, scientists would call evidence. This is not the same as evidence in a courtroom, where you must decide whether it is credible evidence or not. Evidence in science is a fact or observation that is indicative of one and only one hypothesis. And finally, question number 15. Why is a fundamentally religious idea, a dogmatic belief system that fails to explain the evidence taught in science classes? Well, let's look at this a piece at a time. Is the theory of evolution in any way religious? No, no it is not. 
The theory of evolution makes no reference to anything mythological, supernatural, or spiritual. It is unrelated to religion in any way. Next, is it dogmatic? No. No, it is not. Nothing in science is laid down as incontrovertibly true. Everything in science is subject to being revised or discarded as new information becomes available. Is it a belief system? No. No, it is not. The theory of evolution does not form the basis of a religion, philosophy, or moral code. Now, does it fail to explain the evidence? No. It was built from the evidence. Looks like question number 15 was just a bunch of unfounded accusations. Alright, well that's all 15. Looks like we made it through them. I do hope you enjoyed this presentation. If you did, uh, don't forget to like and subscribe, please. And, uh, ooh, hey, it wouldn't hurt if you... It would, it would help us quite a bit, actually, if you told your friends about us. Anyway, thanks for coming. We'll see you next time.